A member says, and I says, well, if we do, we're dead. I says, we'll, we'll have a chance this way. You know, maybe we'll live to fight another day. I remember saying that to him. My name is Paddy Quinn. I was born on a small farm outside the, about a mile outside the village of Blakes. I lived on a farm of about 30 acres. When I was about nine, my father died in 1961. And uh, my mother's left to rear eight of us. So probably times wasn't times as hard enough, you know. But the civil rights broke out. And it was very strange at the time, you know what was going on. But you start to, it was probably the best education that we got. And then you'd see the images of the retina and TV and you start to ask yourself questions, you know what's going on here. But I remember in the summertime when I was off school, I used to work for a local farmer. I used to get a pound a day from Sometimes you get the pound, sometimes you wouldn't, you know, be working helping with the hay. But I remember it was up in very high ground from where I lived. And I remember we were just sitting down having a drop of tea behind some haystack. And you could see the smoke rising out of Belfast, you know. And uh, just thinking, you know, what sort of a place is that down there that these people live in? And you start to identify more and more with these people. And then when you're at home, you see the images on TV. And then you start to realise, you know, these were my people. Um, so things like that kept drawing you more and more to the Republican movement and more to the physical force side of things, because there, there was no other outlet. Once the civil rights movement was gone, that was it. First time our house was raided was 1973. Uh, me and my brother was left at, you know, the tickets out in the morning, you know, six o'clock in the morning, and maybe drag us out, out of the house and stuff. Well, I remember one time my mother, she came out and she, out and she fainted. And we carried her back in. They weren't going to let us, maybe, but we carried her back in anyway, you know. Then I think I was left in away in the helicopter, you know, me and my brother. The time we were caught, actually we walked into an ambush. We got into this quarry and the next thing the shooting started. And there's a big hedge, but they were shooting from a, a like a small mountain, there's a place and they're shooting jimpy light machine guns, you know. But they're shooting tracers, and it was a real hot summer's day, and the grass was going on fire, and it was either Remy says, what will we do? Will we fight it out? Well, I says, Remy, I remember saying and I says, well, if we do, we're dead. I says, will, will we chance this by, you know, maybe we'll live to fight another day. I remember saying that to him. So we ended up in the Kremlin Road. The criminalisation policy was coming in. We hadn't a clue, you know, what we were facing into. The only thing we knew, we weren't going to be criminalised. You're right, the reception area, if you could call it that, and uh, you're put into a cubicle and the uniform was put there, you were tired to step and put that on. Um, and they came back, you know, it was still the same way as it was, you know. And uh, it says, I'm not wearing a prison uniform. I'm not going to be criminalised. I'm not a criminal, you know. The protests intensified. Of course, then the no voice protests started then. The beatings got worse. Um, uh, Cardinal Fee asked us to, uh, not to go on hunger strike to see could he do something, but he met a brick wall, as you know. Uh, first hunger strike happened. Uh, came to an end. It's supposed to be a document. The Brits reneged in it. So Bobby got up and said there's going to be another hunger strike. And he was looking volunteers. This is serious and there could be deaths. I remember uh, Bobby been elected from Manasset throne. We thought they couldn't let Bobby die now on MP, but of course Maggie Thatcher did. And Bobby died. And then the rest of the hunger strike, the first four started then. I remember I was in the chair. Somebody came up to me and said Raymond was dead. I was sort of glad I was in the chair because they will start crying, you know. And the screws couldn't see me, you know. Then it came my turn to go on hunger strike. The first thing that stuck me was Joe McDonald, with hunger strike. 
of a shop to see Joe. Joe was in a wheelchair and his hair was all greasy and his head was hanging way down. Also Martin Horson was sitting at the table and he was drinking water and it was coming up. A man were going over to Joe and saying hello Joe and Joe said who's that, who's that? His head was down, he sort of looked up, I could see his eyes was all over the place, he was blind. I said to Paddy Quinn, Joe, well, mucker, he says, he grabbed my hand and he puts his hand away. Well, mucker, how are you? Yeah, I thought he had met me in the pub or something. You know, I couldn't believe, you know, how good a form he was in. Uh, the next thing I remember was the night Joe died. Uh, I could hear Joe moaning all night. It just seemed to go on and on, and then it just got very quiet when I heard a scream. And it was his wife, Greta. And then I heard all the commotion uh, taking Joe away. Maybe five days later, the same thing. Martin Horson, as I say, Martin never could hold the water down. He went brave and quick. But I could hear him shouting this night. His brother was in the cell with him. I could hear his brother shouting Martin. I could hear Martin shouting... Uh, Uh, um, I could hear him shouting the lights is out, the lights is out, somebody put the lights on and uh, he kept on shouting about the lights and I could hear his brother shouting his name Martin, Martin you know, and went on and then, then he got more incoherent you know he was just shouting doing a lot of shedding out through the night. Um, same thing again. Uh, I got quiet for about 20 minutes and then I could hear the commotion. You know, taking Martin away. Martin was dead and you was dead. That was that. The next probably period was the time I got sick myself. Another thing about the sickness, uh, apart from your tongue and swelled, your mouth all dry, you could smell everything. Your smell increased. I could even smell the water. And it was it smelled stinking, which made it even harder to drink. But then after that, I was on the wheelchair. Haze was gone. Everything was gone, you know. So at that stage, I don't know when they brought it in. You know, once you went unconscious, your next of kin could send a form to take you off the hunger thing. So I think she sat and listened to the racket for a while then. For him sat in front of her. She just got up and signed it. Uh, taken out to the Royal, intensive care, hallucinating still. Uh, eventually started to come around a wee bit. Still didn't know what was going on. Um, and then was moved to Musgrave. I remember I was thinking, can I go back in this hunger thing? And I decided I had it. I couldn't, I just hadn't got it you know, to go on it again. After that, I went to the prison hospital for a while, and then I went from there to the blocks. I remember going into the blocks and the door slammed behind me, into the cell of my own, and I remember sort of breaking down. Uh, but I have to say, the lads in the blocks were brilliant. So the hunger site came to an end. We, felt we got our demands, we got our own clothes. And eventually we got the other things. Uh, I went through a very hard time, you know, after I got out of jail. It took, took me a while to adopt. And then I met Deirdre, the wife, and sort of uh, steadied me up a bit, you know. had more responsibility then. I think the Brits believed that they could get us to wear the prison uniform that they could break the Republican movement outside. But they had to succeeded in that. You know, like, everything, even to think, have had any Republican aspirations at all, uh, they would have been criminalised as well. And that's the reason why we were stuck together and we refu refused to break. The Brits eventually did want to talk. And we had the leadership who was able to stand up and talk to them. I think it would have been a betrayal 
of the hunger strikes that we had at that time. There had been a trail of all the hunger strikers who died and all the volunteers who gave their lives that we had to let this campaign slip.